verbal. So let me double check and see. Well, it's that one and the transparency. Okay. So we do have here, we provide the um, templates. So let me double check with our finance folks and I will follow up with a template for that. And then what was the other one that you had mentioned previously? A Federal Funding Accountability Act, Accountability and Transparency Act. I just want to verify that we have everything and just set because it's still yep. within 15 days. Yeah, so, um, and it's, it's easier to say, we call it the FAFADA. <laughs> it is easier to say than that entire long name. That's another federal deliverable we have related to our funding and it's um, a fiscal deliverable. So we do have the information listed here where to find that and then also where to submit it once you guys have filled that out. So, but if you have any questions about filling that out, just let us know and we can make sure that our fiscal staff um, provide technical assistance as needed. And I will 100% follow up on this very one at station to make sure you guys have all the information you need to fill that out as well. Thank you. And I can go ahead and send it out to the entire group because I'm not sure that that communication has been sent to anybody unless someone else has gotten it and I just <laughs> haven't been made aware of it yet. So great questions though, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then with that, I'm going to pass it over to Emma who is doing additional double duty today to go over the templates. So Emma, if you wanna go ahead and uh, share your screen, I'll stop sharing now. All right, perfect. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And here we go. So schedule of deliverables. Um, so we just reviewed this briefly. Um, the purpose of what I'm going to go over at this time is really to introduce you to the templates. So some of these deliverables have templates and some of them do not. So um, I will address a little bit of the ones that do not as well afterwards, but again, I'm um, intending to show you the templates primarily. So actually, let me, oh, look at that, I still have this going, okay. So the ones that we do have templates for um, programmatically that I'm able to show you today right now is the access needs assessment due October 1st, the access strategic plan due January 15th. And this one actually has three templates. There's a strategic plan document um, template that I'll show you, which identifies within that you also need to utilize the action plan template as well as the evaluation plan template. So I'll show you those as well. Then we have the access logic model due November 1st and the access innovative prevention program intervention protocol July 31st. And that has been a mouthful I've been stumbling over. We usually just call it the IP protocol. Um, so as you see, these are not in order. They were just listed and then I put the due dates. So this is the um, first one will be um, completing. However, I'm going to go in order that um, is listed here. And let me see if I guess I need to hit exit. All right. So the needs assessment. Um, turn off the camera and refer to the document here. Okay, so the needs assessment, again, this one is done once every three years. Um, there are some minimum, minimum requirements, but you can add, add more information as, um, as you wish. So this is right here, just kind of an overview of why we need to do needs assessments. Really important that our programs are data-driven and that we're targeting um, actual community needs and that we have information to support that. Um, and then we can also, you know, monitor our progress. So um, this information here is essentially indicating that um, it needs to be done, done once every three years. Um, like I said earlier, you can submit one that's um, been done previously if it is less than three years old. 
And moving forward, um, you'll want to make sure these required elements are uh, accounted for in your needs assessment. So here's the required elements. This really talks about um, the current efforts and resources and gaps are things that you want to include here. Um, so I'm very briefly summarizing these bullets here for you. Um, we want to look at local data, local um, use, risk and protective factors and consequences, local training capacity for substance use prevention, local resources such as your treatment uh, availability, referral agencies, of course, demographics and uh, sustainability of local data collection methods and efforts. So that's kind of like a high level required elements, but then the, below here, there is a template. So this can assist. Um, you can utilize this template by entering in information directly, or you can of course utilize your own format. And we're just looking that this information, these elements would be included there. So of course, um, formal document, you're going to want a table of contents, your community region description, and then um, just items here, you know, give us some information on how the data was collected. Are you using surveys, focus groups? Um, who are you representing in that data, et cetera? Um, of course, needs assessments and data are really not very useful if we don't apply them. So you want to, you know, let us know what are those findings. Like, so not just the raw data, but kind of try to synthesize that and let us know what does that mean for you in your community? What are the findings? Um, as well as conclusions. So, um, of course, what are the priorities that are going to come out of that uh, regarding the health problems, the risk and protective factors, the consequences, et cetera. Um, and there's really just a lot of detail here in terms of um, what we would be looking for that you can include. And then, of course, references. So that's a really quick and dirty overview of the needs assessment. Um, again, we're going to share these templates with you uh, with the updated information. Um, some of them have dates in them that may be last year's dates. They may say, you know, please contact Gabby Richard, but at this point in time, we do have um, dedicated grant coordinators to work with you. So we'll replace Gabby's name with, um, you know, your assigned grant coordinator. So that would be the only difference between these ones that we put out in the RFP as attachments that you currently have access to. Um, but we will be sending these out with the updates. So just so you know, to be aware that that's coming. Um, we do intend to provide additional TA as the year goes on. So once it gets closer to this one being due, we will touch base with you and, you know, see how it's going and see if we can provide any further guidance. But just a quick overview of what you can expect from this template here. Okay, so the next template that we have is the strategic plan. So similarly, um, once we do a needs assessment, then we can plan based on the findings in that needs assessment. And this is a formalized version of a roadmap and how an agency or coalition will accomplish your substance abuse prevention goals. Again, once every three years, um, updated as needed as priority shift. And similarly, you know, once again, that if you have a strategic plan already existing, please do submit that one to us. Um, we can review it and see, you know, if there's gaps here, but um, essentially utilizing this information for, uh, for your strategic plans moving forward. Our required elements in our templates here. Um, one thing that this does say is that this doesn't need to be limited to only your SABG prevention funding. You may have other funding sources. You can include that information here. Um, you could also include information as to, you know, how to strategize in building additional funding resources. That can be a pretty strong piece of a strategic plan is to see um, what other funding resources are currently available or that um, 
other additional resources to support unmet needs. So this should follow the strategic prevention framework, and you'll see that as we look at the template. You're familiar with that framework. So again, formal document, table of contents, executive summary. And here's where you see the strategic prevention plan kind of laid out in front of us, and that's really what this document follows. So of course, um, an ass assessment related to current substance use issues, you know, reflect on what you found in your needs assessment, capacity, what kind of training is available, what kind of um, opportunities are there, this guy. Planning, so the next uh, kind of section of this SPIF and including SMART goals and objectives. Here's where you see we do have the action implementation plan here where we do provide a separate template, but it is connected to this one. The logic model is another deliverable you will have already done by then, so you could just insert that. And identification of uh, the programs that you'll use or that, that, that are needed in the community. Implementation plan, so you know, you want to include things like who will implement, how will they monitor for fidelity to the program model, and evaluation. So this is where there's another template provided. I think it may be listed down here. Um, it looks like we didn't include that information here, but we do have an evaluation template that you can utilize for this as well, including process and outcome measures. Cultural competency. So, of course, cultural competency, not just information about um, materials being provided in a second language or things like that. Those are excellent. But, you know, really how will you ensure prevention activities are inclusive and regionally or locally representative of the community of focus? What kind of people are you going to include to help ensure that and what barriers might you have? Sustainability plan, a list of acronyms and abbreviations if needed or as needed. I know in state government, we have a lot of those. We have, <laughs> I was showing a new staff member, there's like, was it 1,500 acronyms or something for, on the access website? So please do uh, help us get oriented to your acronyms. And a stakeholder or partner list. So this looks kind of like those um, 12 sectors. Of course, the conclusion and appendices. So that's the strategic plan. I think I'll pause there. Um, those are two larger documents. Are there any questions on the needs assessment or the strategic plan? Hi, this is Courtney. Um, so in our original application, we provided a strategic plan and an action plan. Do you guys want to see those like reworked is what we're saying? So I think that you can, um, if there was any feedback during the RFP process as to if we had information noting potential gaps in the plan or something like that, um, it would be probably beneficial to address those gaps. Um, however, really you, if it's still a current plan, you could likely just submit that document as your deliverable for this, um, this deliverable year. Perfect, thank you. And then just a caveat, Emma, um, existing strategic plans absolutely can be submitted if they're within that three-year time frame. But just make sure that they do incorporate the items listed in the templates just to make sure that it is succinct um, with what we're looking for. Um, so if you need to add any addendums to your current plan or appendices to the current plan to make sure those items are addressed, that's definitely something we recommend as well for um, approval processes. If you guys have any questions about how to do that, please just let us know. Okay, so the next one is the action plan. So again, this is a part of the strategic plan deliverable. And this is a document to help you really outline and organize your program information. 
in terms of goals and objectives and CSAP strategies with some detailed information here. Um, there is this top section to be filled out. I think in our last year's round of deliverables, this was often <laughs> missed. So you can fill out this information here. Um, again, this doesn't have to be limited to the SABG prevention funding. Here's some other ideas um, that you know coalitions may have. Um, if it's something that you want to do but you don't have funding, um, you can indicate that here. So basically with this one, it's kind of self-explanatory. Read through and answer these questions here for each goal, objective, and CSAP strategy. So this might say like, you know, um, good behavior game. And then you would say it's funded by SABG. Um, briefly state the main purpose of the activity. So you would say we're, you know, providing um, educational information to elementary school kids uh, in the good, from the good behavior game to address XYZ behaviors or prevent XYZ. Um, is it uh, administered twice a week? Is it an hour long session? Is it, you know, once a month? That's the kind of information you want to hear. And identifying um, the population and if uh, which IOM category that's related to, and then um, lead and responsible parties, and if there's any surveys attached to that that you utilize. So then you could just utilize um, additional boxes for other activities or programs. Say so you do a social norms campaign separate from your program, you can put that one here. And then say you do certain you know, at, outreach activities and you want to let us know about those as well. You could put those here. So and this is an example where we do have dates in here that we'll be updating and this here will be updated as well. You'll be working with your assigned uh, grant coordinator. Okay, and then our evaluation plan template. So um, pretty similar up here, but then for each program and activity, we want to um, document your process and outcome measures, the tool or instrument that you are using to evaluate and how fidelity is measured as well. So process, out, process measures right here, you might um, indicate the number of people served, number of people trained, um, number of sessions provided, something like that, that is part of the implementation, part of the process. Outcome measures, of course, you would want to indicate things like changes. Are you going to be looking at changes in risk perception, changes in parental monitoring, you know, different risk and protective factors, or potentially even actual use? Are you going to be looking at 30-day um, reported, self-reported alcohol use or something like that. The tool or instrument that you're going to use to um, measure that and then for here, these are often different surveys. Some evidence-based practices come with these or sometimes you may um, select other survey or instruments such as a community survey to collect that information and then fidelity measures. So this might be like a implementation checklist or something like that. And again, repeat per um, program or activity. Any questions on the action plan or evaluation plan templates? We did have one question in the chat here um, from Jamal. Um, saying, are we allowed to submit a request to change the evidence-based or, infor or informate or inform program, excuse me, uh, we put into the proposal? And I'm just typing a response and I just want to say, yes, definitely. Um, if things change, we anticipate that as you guys go through these planning processes and assessing processes that um, things may change, um, implementation plans may get tweaked. Uh, that's the nature of our services. They evolve frequently depending on the needs of the community. 
Um, so yes, that's okay. Just make sure that the programs selected or the interventions selected are within the um, requirements of the RFP and the scope of work. Um, and then also that they're included in your deliverable submissions. Um, so we're aware of which programs are currently being utilized. So yeah, don't worry, you're not locked into it, <laughs> um, but just let us know what changes are happening so that we can make sure we're providing um, monitoring and, and oversight as much as possible. And then we do have a question asking for some more information about process measures and maybe giving an example. So Emma, do you wanna try one or would you like me to come up with some process measure ideas? <laughs> I can do that. Um, so process measures again are really those measures that indicate um, things that happen during implementation. So, um, you know, you're doing trainings, you're doing um, education sessions, you're doing um, information dissemination. So these process measures are really documenting those efforts. Um, for example, when I was doing direct service prevention and I was facilitating one-on-one -on -one support group or one-on-one -on -one sessions, I also was doing um, group sessions and I was also doing um, classroom education. So I would want to indicate how many classroom sessions I did. Um, <laughs> and I had a very in-depth database I would do how many sessions I did, how many individuals were present and received that information, um, how long the session was, what topics the sessions were. So those are examples of process measures as opposed to outcome measures, which is what we're actually trying to change with the programming. Things like those risk and behavior factors, the um, actual use, those risk behaviors, the, the why we're actually doing this work, the outcomes and the impacts. Does that answer the question? Yep, thank you, it awesome. did. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Okay. Awesome. Okay, and then we will move on to the IP protocol. Um, again, we're going to be doing a TA session over this document um, next week on the 14th, and that is in advance of the due date for this being July 31st. I do recognize now that that is, uh, I, I believe it's a weekend, so if that ever happens, then the deliverable would be due on the next business day. So I believe that's August 2nd, but please refer to your calendar, <laughs> next business day. Um, so, but we will do an overview of this one as well. So this is our document that we ask you to submit um, if you're going to be doing a program that is, um, you're not sure if it's evidence-based um, or if, you know, you can, again, refer to these um, classifications. We have our evidence-based practice definition here. Essentially, if it's not this, you probably want to submit this protocol for us. We will also look at it in terms of identifying if it's a promising practice or an innovative. Um, we'll help to identify the status of this, um, of your intended program. So, again, this is kind of important because we want to ensure that our efforts pay off. Um, programs come in varying levels of quality and effectiveness, and that's really kind of the idea behind this. We also do recognize that not every EBP is necessarily um, maybe modern or contemporary or potentially applicable to all communities. So we want to be we, we want to have some flexibility in that rule, and that's why we have this protocol. Um, we also want to avoid any um, you know implementation of programs that are you know perhaps harmful. So this helps us try to find um, the right evidence base or uh, designation for programs. So um, we currently are using guidance from SAMHSA um, to guide this document. You may be familiar with this resource called Selecting Best Fit Programs and Practices, a guidance for substance misuse prevention practitioners. And so, um, Again, this kind of explaining what I had just indicated about 
um, the right fit for programs and communities. So evidence-based practices, again, here's that definition. So this is where they're either listed in a federal registry of evidence-based interventions. Um, they have positive effects on the primary targeted outcome reported in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, they may have been based on guidelines from CSAP and has ev documented evidence of effectiveness based on a theory of change, maybe similar in content and structure to interventions that appear in the federal registry. And, you know, so we're really looking at documentation that it is having positive effects on the intended outcome. Here's one to reviewed and deemed appropriate by a panel of informed prevention experts, including qualified prevention researchers. So you may think that your program is evidence-based and it's not, <laughs> or you may think that your program is not evidence-based. And once you review these, um, all of these criteria here, you may find that it, that it actually is. So it's not just simply that it's listed on the registry. There's other items here. Uh, promising practices are those that have they're based on statistical analysis or well-established theory of change and show potential for meeting evidence base, but maybe it's just not quite there yet, versus innovative where it has a promising approach but needs further refinement and evaluation. So we, you know, we purpose of this again is so that access can review these and help designate them prior to implementation. And then you just simply um, answer these questions based on the program that you're intending to implement. <clears throat> and I could just pause here so you can kind of browse what's on there. I don't think that we necessarily need to read it 100%. Again, we are having that TA session next week, um, which is optional, but certainly recommended if you have not completed this um, before. And then essentially, Access will review it and we hope to provide a, um, information to you within 14 business days. This is one, again, that will be updated with um, dates and um, new directions for the uh, contacting your grant coordinators. So that's the IP protocol due um, August 31st. Oh, I think you mean What's July that? 31st <laughs> or August 2nd. <laughs> Yes, I did. Thank you, Gabby. <laughs> no worries. Um, there is a question um, that I think would be good for the entire group to hear. So um, it's in regards to some of you who may have already submitted this documentation if or when you were under a REBA and the REBA submitted this information to access and whether or not you have to resubmit. Um, what we will say to that, and we can follow up with some other guidance um, after the TA session we have next week, um, but if your programs are 100% the same from when they were being implemented under the REBA and you already submitted this information to REBA, the REBA and got the information back from access through the REBA, you do not need to resubmit these programs again. That's again, if they're 100% the same. What we would ask um, instead of resubmitting the protocol is that you submit an attestation letter. Um, and if you have any questions about what is an attestation letter. It's usually just a letter on the agency or entity's um, letterhead stating that you are at attesting to the fact that the deliverable has not changed since the previous submission and the access has the current information based on last year's submission um, so that you do not need to resubmit. So we'll say that you can do that in place of resubmitting the protocol. But again, that's just if your programs have remained the same. If there are changes and you're not sure if they warrant a new protocol, let us know prior to the due date and we can talk through that and whether or not we recommend resubmitting the protocol. Um, by all means, you don't have to start from scratch. You can use the information you provided previously and make a couple tweaks to the document and then resubmit it. Um, that's kind of what we're going to go off of at this point. Does anybody have any questions or can I provide further clarification on that in our process for this one? Yeah, if you have any questions, let us know. <laughs> We're here to help. Um, 
So yeah, so if you are saying that nothing has changed, just go ahead and submit an attestation letter in place of this deliverable, and we will go ahead and use that documentation moving forward. Are we able to access all this info? Sandra, are you talking about accessing the templates or the PowerPoint or anything else from today? We will send, okay, yeah. So all of these templates were included within the RFP um, as exhibits or appendices, but we will be sending these out, as Emma mentioned earlier, with the updates to the names and the dates. So you guys will have this information uh, before the due date so you guys can start working on these templates. So I did just want to, um, that does uh, conclude our template overview, but I did also just want to um, explain a couple others of these. So um, the publication materials, there's no template for that. You're actually submitting your actual materials that you intend to publish um, under the grant. So that's what that one would be. Um, operational review documents, I think that probably makes sense Let me, um, there's other questions um, the budget we do have a template for that but um, that one's not due until May 3rd you all have already submitted your budget so that's why we didn't review that one. Oh, the logic model I almost forgot that one good thing I reviewed this I'll show you the logic model and then um, these ones here the SABG activities and expenditure plan and the report with the same name those are our required reporting to SAMHSA. So those templates we will provide, but we don't, we don't have those at this time. We receive those from SAMHSA each year, and then we pass them on to our contractors. And so those will be available um, to you as soon as they're available to us, we'll um, get them ready for you as well. So those will have templates, just not yet. <laughs> um, the IP protocol. No template for the training plan. Uh, we will go over the Wellingtons here to do these evaluation ones for us. And I think we just addressed these a little bit ago. So um, with that, let me show you the logic model. Okay, so um, many of you also submitted logic models with your RFP. This may look familiar. Many of you may have um, attended a training that we did um, with LaCroix and Milligan on this logic model template last year. It is available on our access website for your reference to that um, training. But, um, you know, essentially this is a high level bird's eye view of your programming. So it also is a, it kind of tells a story in a logical sequence since the logic model um, from left to right essentially we're trying to address these long-term consequences, um, which are related to these behavioral health problems. You enter yours in here. Um, but we know we don't just tell people to, you know, not use illicit substances and then they don't do them. We <laughs> work on um, all these risk and protective factors to help that process. So we identify what those are. These here are laid out um, we have identified several salient risk factors and protective factors throughout the state. So that's why you see some of these are already filled in. Um, these are ones that we know need addressed in the state. However, you can add yours. And then the local conditions are, okay, so those are, those risk and protective factors are some issues, but more specifically in your community, why are those an issue? And then um, what are we doing about it? Those CSAP strategies you can list and specifically identify what you're doing. Um, and then the evaluation plan. So what evaluation methods or tools are you doing for each of those? So um, again, high level review of the logic model. Um, there is a training available on this and we will provide additional TA when this is closer to being due, but just another sneak peek at this um, template. I do have this pulled up in um, Adobe, but of course, when you edit it, it will be a um, PowerPoint <laughs> template that's obviously editable so that you can enter your information.
and questions or comments on that one. So I'm not seeing any in the chat box. I did put the link to the recorded logic model training um, that is on our access website um, within our grant page. Uh, so you guys are able to access that. And for the purposes of the workforce development and training plan by you looking at this training, the recorded version, that would be acceptable for the completion of that deliverable, that training portion. So just so you guys are aware, you can review that recording, tell us you've reviewed it, and that would be what you need to do for that specific training requirement in the workforce development plan. So, so there won't be a certificate given or anything, just as long as we watch the training and, that's, and we put in the date we watched it. Yep, you just have to put into your plan that, you know, you look at it this day or you're going to look at it that way. And then that will be something we check in on on the site visit operational review just to attest that that was completed um, at that point. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And then just a quick update on the marijuana attestation. I just checked in with fiscal staff and what we're actually going to do, you guys do not need to do anything on your end at this point for the marijuana attestation. Access will be generating contract amendments, including the marijuana attestation form, which is a federal deliverable. Um, so we will be initiating those amendments on our end, and then they will be going to the signature authority or whoever was designated to be the contract contact with procurement for signature. So at that point, um, that's when you guys will, the ball will be in your court to ensure that's signed and sent back to access. But if you have any questions about that process, please let us know. So. One less thing to worry about at this point in time, uh, just make sure that when those amendments start coming out that um, your signature authority or whoever's in charge to, to make the signing authority is aware of that. Great. Ms. Gabby, wondering, uh, this is Jamal, mm -hmm. um, what might be in that marijuana attestation? I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah, so that's actually a new requirement from SAMHSA. Um, so when, um, as we know, marijuana as a substance is still recognized as illegal at a federal level. Um, so SAMHSA had to come together with guidance for states that were legalizing marijuana um, to ensure that um, even though marijuana use may be legal for recreational or medical purposes in certain states, that um, state contracted entities and entities that receive these federal fundings are aware that it is still legal on a federal level at this point, um, and that marijuana cannot be used for any type of treatment or prevention activity um, under these funds. Um, mainly it falls into treatment more so than prevention. Um, usually it's something that our treatment providers have to attest to that they're not going to use marijuana as a treatment modality um, or you know, tell someone that you should smoke marijuana instead of doing this other type of treatments. Just again, it's just kind of a formality with the feds for these funds, uh, but it is just one of those items that SAMHSA has been um, asking us to submit. So the actual documentation and the language will be a lot more succinct with what SAMHSA's requirements are, but that's basically a gist of it is that we're attesting that we would not use marijuana for any type of prevention or um, treatment activity, even if it is legal in the state, which now it is legal in Arizona for recreational use. Great, thanks. Yeah, no problem. All right. Let's see if there's any other questions here. Um, and it looks like um, there's some more people who didn't get the email for the training for next week. So we'll make sure that we have your names and we'll send it out. Um, I think what we can do, since everyone had to register for this training, I do have a list of the registrants. We'll probably just go ahead and send out the notice to everybody who is here today, just so everyone has it. <laughs> um, so if you get it twice, we apologize, but just to make sure that everyone has it, we'll make sure that we send it out to this group today. Perfect. And then as Emma mentioned, um, it's our plan to do dedicated TA sessions as deliverables come due. So you'll notice we did the one for next week for durable is coming due at the end of this month. And then we'll kind of time our other TA sessions around those timeframes as well. So those TA sessions are optional, uh, but we do highly recommend just to jump on and listen. Um, also, if you have any questions about anything, it's sometimes good to hear other people's questions, other people's thoughts, 
um, get some feedback before you submit the deliverable to make sure that the most um, complete and hopefully approvable deliverable is submitted the first time. Um, so just anything we can do to help that, we can absolutely make sure we can do that for you. And the training date and time for next week, it is um, a week from today, the 14th. It's going to be in a Google Meet format. So if that may cause any issues, just be aware of that in the beginning. We do use Google Meets for the majority of our meetings, except for today we had access to Zoom. Um, and it's gonna be starting at 1 p.m. and go until 2 p.m. All right, any other questions about templates? Anything else in the contract requirements before we move into evaluation? Well, actually, we can take a break before evaluation. <laughs> if people need a break before we talk about data, sometimes I do, so I understand. <laughs> I can go ahead and start if you want me to, but do people need a break? Yeah, let's do a quick check in. Would you guys like to take a break now or do you want to wait until our break time, which I think is two o'clock, so about 20 minutes? What would be the group's preference? If there is a preference. <laughs> let's keep going. Keep going? Keep going. Okay, perfect. So, all right. Yep, I'm seeing keep and going. Let's, let's keep on trucking. You guys are soldiers, so great job. <laughs> so, Jane, if you want to go ahead and start presenting, um, I think you should be able to. You're still a co-host, I'm pretty sure. Okay, does it show up? Yep, it looks great. Okay, good. All right, this is it. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jane, and uh, there's two other key members of the team. We have a big team, uh, but these, uh, Samantha and Lyra, are the key uh, contact people uh, for this particular project. Um, and so they're, they're listed on here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go through an overview. And again, just like what Access has been presenting, it's a lot of information. You don't have to take notes because you're going to get a manual and a guide that says everything I'm going to say this afternoon. So uh, you can just listen and absorb all of this information. Um, and here we go. So there will be an evaluation guide for administering the Access SABG primary prevention evaluation tools. And this is, um, is kind of a new thing that we're doing with Access, where we're looking across all the SABG uh, primary prevention program contractors and setting up um, evaluation tools for them. So the manual is actually going to be a guide for how to implement these tools. And there'll be instructions in there on why the evaluation's being administered and how it should be administered by programs. And again, I'm gonna go through sort of a 30,000 foot view of it today, um, but it'll be, the detail is in the guide. Um, and any questions you have about the evaluation, you can address to your access SABG primary prevention program managers and you all have their different names now. And uh, we will dis distribute this guide either electronically or, or SharePoint. And I know there's right now we're sort of delayed on SharePoint, so it'll probably be coming out electronically first and then just placed on there in case you uh, delete your copy. So the purpose of the uh, primary prevention evaluation tools is to help access um, and the uh, grantees to adhere to the funding guidelines. And as you heard this morning, um, a portion of the block grant funds are there to support primary prevention and the different activities and uh, services that for people that are not identified as needing treatment. And we have to collect performance and outcome data to determine what the effectiveness of these um, behavioral health promotion and prevention services, what the effectiveness is. And the purpose of the primary prevention evaluation is to assess, what, assess whether or not these components that are being implemented uh, work and whether or not they're having an impact uh, on determinants, the important behaviors and overall health goals. And uh, that whole concept is demonstrated um, in this example here where you have your evidence-based program uh, in schools and youth serving agencies. 
and there's individual determinants are the increased knowledge, you want to improve uh, refusal skills and improve perception of risk and harm and attitudes about use, substance use. And if you do those things, then you're gonna impact these behaviors. You're gonna delay initiation of drinking alcohol, reduce the frequency of uh, alcohol-related deaths and reduce health risk. And you'll achieve your ultimate goal, which is to reduce underage drinking. So the hypotheses that uh, the program is operating under is to determine again, the impact of the prevention programs on key risk and protective factors for certain populations. So our first hypotheses, and I'm, I'll divert for a moment here. These are primarily focused on youth, but we do recognize that there are um, adult programs uh, that have been funded and they will be, um, they're incorporated uh, into the evaluation piece. But the hypotheses are primarily uh, focused on the youth and the parents. Um, the first one is that the more informed youth are about risk and harm uh, of all of the uh, sub various substance uses, and the more unfavorable their attitudes are towards those substances, then their use of those substances will become less. And the better that the interpersonal relationships and positive perception of school safety, the more likely youth will seek help at a school from a counselor, teacher, or even another adult. And the third one is that the more parents and youth engage in communication around resistance strategies to reduce underage drinking, marijuana use and misuse and abuse of prescription medication, the less likely they are to report 30 day use. So these are kind of just the three overlying uh, areas that we're looking at. Whoops. Um, and the performance measures are, and these are prescribed by SAMHSA, um, are reduced morbidity. And the key one here is abstinence from drug use and alcohol use. And under this particular uh, measure, we have four areas. We're looking at 30-day use. We're looking at percep perception of risk and harm of use. We're looking at age of first use and perception of disapproval or attitudes um, by the youth themselves and by their peers. Um, the next area is employment and education. And one of them is uh, perception of workplace policy. And when I first saw this, um, when this came out a few years ago, I thought, well, that's kind of hard to ask you know, youth in schools. And so the item that we do have on the survey asks what, you know, what, what their perception, if they were, would they be hired, you know, if they were hired at a place that did random drug and alcohol tests, would they work there? And uh, those types of questions. Um, and then also average daily school attendance rate uh, is the other measure. And then we have family communications around drug and alcohol use. And here we have um, just self-report by youth about how many times that uh, they um, are uh, talking to their parents and then also self-report by the parent, how many times the parents are talking to the kids. And when oftentimes when we've seen this in other evaluations, we see that uh, youth report one and parents report the other, you know, into the scale. Um, but um, their, perceptions are, their perceptions are different. Then the last one is social connectedness. And here, what we're gonna look at here is the percentage of youth that report seeing, reading, watching, or listening to a prevention uh, message. So the survey tools that we're going to be using, there's three types that we've developed. There's the pre-post, pre of course is given before the actual program starts and post is given after the program. Then there's the post only. And in some cases, you might have a program that it might be just a one session only uh, program. Um, and it's just, and we can only do a post uh, um, because of the type of program it is. Um, and then there's another type of survey, it's called a retrospective pre. You can use this in multi-session programs and also single session programs. And I'll go a little more detail on that in just a minute. Um, and then um, the, um, components and the tools and everything are outlined uh, guide and you really need to adhere to those so that you're complying with all your contract requirements under access. And then the coalitions um, that are funded um, under this program, um, we're asking um, that the facilitators um, or program managers uh, complete this checklist. It's in appendix A of the guide and it looks like this. 
and it's the Evaluation Project Assurances and Confidentiality Checklist. And we ask that they go through and read this and complete it. And the reason is that we wanna make sure people that are administering the surveys and that are uh, talking to the, the participants about taking the survey are you know, treating it um, uh, appropriately. For example, the program staff need to be trained in the data collection and reporting, um, and we'll be providing TA on that. Um, and the program managers need to ensure that they're adhering to the requirements uh, in the guide. So that means some periodic checking uh, to make sure that that's, that's happening. And also ensuring confidentiality, like you don't sit and read the information on the surveys and talk about it you know, to other people that uh, are not involved in the program. Um, and then program staff uh, also will need to enter the data from the evaluation tools within five days of completion. And we put that in there because so many times you know, people um, forget about it and, uh, and then uh, they lose some of the surveys or they don't know, you know, they don't remember what, what happened uh, to them and we lose data that way. Um, and the program facilitators, facilitators um, have sample scripts that we've provided and um, you can use those scripts or come up with your own, but kind of, but you need to adhere to uh, the concepts that are being uh, addressed in the scripts. And then also to contact their program manager with any, uh, any issues that uh, arise during the administration of the evaluation tools. And then they sign off on this. And we find that by going through a checklist like this and having it done, it's sort of, you know, you're signing something that it, it kind of cements it in that facilitator's mind that, you know, I have certain routine I have to follow here and certain guidelines. Then uh, within SAMHSA, uh, they have identified specific domains uh, that are called national outcome measures. And you've probably heard of these and we call them NOMS. Again, we have a lot of acronyms here. And these domains um, are national, obviously, but they cross across all of uh, a lot of federally funded programs, not just the SABG uh, grants. Um, and, uh, but all the recipients of funding from SAB uh, programs across the nation must report on these outcome measures. And we've provided a matrix in the evaluation guide and it re represents the beginning of a state level reporting system that we hope will create an accurate and current national picture of uh, a state level picture that look, then we can compare with the national picture of substance abuse and mental health services. And the tape, there's a table one in the guide and includes the evaluation questions and objectives for the required um, national measures. And again, these are required for federal reporting. And so uh, we, need to collect, we need to collect data on these. And again, uh, I kind of looked at these at the beginning, uh, but it's these, this abstinence from drug and alcohol use, uh, the employment and education, these are the required measures. And then what we've done to make your life easier, um, it may not look like that, but we've, we hope it does, is that we've written objectives for all the NOMS measures. So, and these are just examples. So you're gonna have um, objective 1A, for example, is, and you insert the date by you know, June, uh, 2022, uh, there'll be a 1% increase in the percentage of youth who report no use of alcohol in the past 30 days as measured by the Youth Primary Prevention Survey. And we have the Youth Primary Prevention Survey for you. Um, so I think someone mentioned earlier about the Arizona Youth Survey. And you will notice that when you look at the survey that we have uh, for this project, the Primary Prevention Survey for the youth, that some of the measures on there are identical to the AYS measures. So if you don't have an AYS that was administered during a particular year, you'll have this data. So you have these data that you can kind of look at. And these data also match, of course, the national outcome measures. So, you know, it's, it's consistent across, so it can be a consistent across areas. Um, and so these are just examples here of what these objectives look like. And so when you're working on your evaluation plan, you can use these objectives to drop in um, and talk about what measure you're going to use. And these are quote smart objectives because they're measurable and they have a time, uh, time period on it and it tells exactly what they're going to be doing and how they're going to be measured. Um, and we have the different uh, percent 
change that we want to see in here. And these are just some others for the ones that for the education employment one, we say uh, youth part by such and such a date, youth participants will show at least a 5% increase in their pos positive perception regarding workplace policy of random drug and alcohol tests. And you can all pause here for a second. You can look at these others, but these are just examples of the NOMS objectives. And then there's a second table in the guide um, that um, has optional risk and protective factor measure, uh, that you might be addressing. And again, it depends on what your, your program is, uh, but we've kind of gone through and we've been involved with prevention programs for years. And so we've gone through and picked out the ones that we think are probably gonna be the ones that are uh, most likely to be um, addressed um, as optional risk and protective factors. And, um, and we've added a few that weren't uh, always uh, listed for youth, uh, again, for the elderly population, uh, for the adult population. Um, so the second table, uh, we're looking at the school community factor. And under here, we've, we've developed items and um, objectives for the school engagement, physical and psychological safety under individual factors. These We've done things for these four um, factors where we've come up with items. And um, these are uh, research-based items um, for to measure like self-efficacy or social connectedness, uh, both in the youth and adults. Uh, family factors, the parent-child communication, we've already covered that. And community factors. And here we've got societal community norms, adult knowledge of substance use and adult involvement and community action. And then of course the coalition, uh, it, there's a community factor here where we're looking at collaboration, coordination and cooperation among the nonprofit organizations, government agencies and mm -hmm. other organizations with common prevention goals. Mm -hmm. And um, I know Gabby was talking earlier about the, you know, the system-wide uh, looking at the systems wide approach. And um, so one of the measures that we're gonna use here is called the Wilder Collaboration Factors Inventory. And some of you that have worked with Wellington in the past with your coalitions, uh, you've, you've done this Wilder uh, with your coalitions, but it's an annual uh, inventory that's done. And it really provides your coalition with some nice feedback on areas that they might need to focus on to strengthen them but it also gives them good feedback on what's working for them. And um, it, it's, it's a nice reinforcement. So this will be a survey um, inventory that you'll, you'll use with your coalitions. And then for the adult risk and protective factors, we've got um, the optional ones, again, family factor here, where we're looking at uh, the area of clear expectations for behavior and values. We'll look at adult attitude, adult perception of risk and harm. And then also the family providing structure limits, rules, monitoring and predictability. Uh, community factor is some of the same that we saw earlier, uh, but this time we're focused, the items are uh, in the surveys are focused on um, these particular areas for adults. And then um, in the, uh, there's a chart in the guide that provides an overview of the evaluation uh, tool items. And there are the specific questions listed for each domain, um, survey questions. And then there, as part of the chart on the right hand side, there's a whole area that says what's being evaluated. And here it lists the specific domain and risk and protective factor, the scale that's being used, and then why whatever you're looking at, why it is being evaluated. And we cite the research in there, the research studies, what do the research studies say about this and the impact on prevention of substance use. And this takes up quite a bit of space in the guide, but I feel it's important because when you're doing an evaluation and oftentimes you have like a third party evaluator that comes in and, and does this, and, but when you're gonna be collecting the data, administering the surveys and looking at it and having to explain it, then you need to know why you, are you evaluating this? And so we're giving you some information here um, in, in, uh, and not you know, a bunch of statistics, but we're giving you the information uh, from the research studies that says, 
what the impact is on the prevention of substance use that you can use uh, to justify why you're doing uh, certain surveys and evaluations. Um, then the requirements for the evaluation, and these are part of your, uh, your I think in the RFP or the um, contract, the evaluation system uh, that we describe in the guide is required for the primary prevention programs funded under this grant. And that, you know, you shouldn't be conducting your own pre and post evaluation activities. You should just focus on doing these uh, that are in here. And you're going to be getting some Excel uh, spreadsheets um, and we've developed them for uh, each view where you'll be entering your data from the surveys. And again, we'll pr be providing a training session on this. Um, the survey data will be entered again within five days after administering the survey. And the guide's gonna pr provide you with instruction for how to enter it. And then the, we've built in formulae, so you don't have to uh, do the calculations. The calculations will be done for you. And um, then each spreadsheet is set up so that you're going to see the survey items, the rating scales that are used, and how all the calculations are done for frequencies and means. Um, and it'll also collect uh, information on the demographic information that you need, like youth age, gender, race, race ethnicity, the county uh, that they're from, or if they're in a program offered by a tribal nation. Um, the pre and post results um, are not going to be linked, so there won't be any identifiers um, that are needed, and we're only going to be reporting, access is only going to um, end up reporting aggregate data, so they don't need the individual um, identifiers. Um, the analysis of the data will be used for program management and performance improvement, and you'll be able to look at the results and say, you know, we, we didn't we came out kind of low in this area. We really didn't talk about this. We need to be, you know, uh, making sure that this is mentioned in the program uh, if we're measuring it. And um, then the evaluation tools themselves, the surveys, uh, can be printed or put up on Sur Survey Monkey, um, and um, we can help you um, show you how to do that. Um, and then the collection of the following outcome data uh, is required. Um, and you're going to be using the pre-post tools, post only and retrospective. It'll depend on what your objectives are. And again, we're going to be working with each of you um, to go through and help you uh, select which is going to be the best tool for your program. And like I said earlier, the post only tool um, includes items that measure self-report of increase in knowledge or awareness, like that it might just be a one session thing and, and you ask them, you know, did, you, did your knowledge increase after hearing this information about da 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 da? And um, they can um, answer that. You're not gonna be able to measure percent gain. You're just gonna be able to see that there's a self-report of uh, increase or self-report of intention to do something on that post only. With the retrospective, like I said, whoops, what did I do? Oh, the retrospective, like I said, um, is a way to assess participants' self-reported changes. Um, and uh, af after the program, this tool is given after the program and it can be a multi-session program or one time only. But you ask them to read the question and rate their current knowledge or skill or attitude or behavior right now after they've had this program or after they heard the presentation, they're supposed to rate their, their, um, their knowledge, skill, attitude, or behavior on, the, on a scale. And then you have them think back to before the participating in the program and how, how did they feel then or what did they know then before the program. Now you can look at, it's sort of like a pre-post, you can look at um, the difference between before and after the program and get a percent change. We find with parent programs that this tool, this type of tool worked because oftentimes parents would come into their parent program and they would rate themselves pretty high on family functioning and family management and because they didn't want anybody to think that they weren't doing a good job. But then they take the program and at the end of the program, they go, ah, oh, you know what? I really wasn't that great at the beginning of the program. And now 
they're rating themselves high again, you know, and so there's no big change uh, in their in their uh, uh, ratings. So it's not it wasn't a pre post really didn't work for them. So we recommended doing these retrospective pre's and now we get a pretty good picture of the change uh, in these parent programs. This is this one has worked out pretty well for that. Um, then also, uh, in terms of data collection, you'll have a particular time frame. We're going to uh, we'll look at what your internal uh, timeline is on your program implementation. Some of you will have programs that go four weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, or they might be one shot programs. Um, and so when we look at the data from the pre post evaluation tools, we want to be sure we're organizing it by program participation year. Uh, you don't want to be doing a pre uh, survey in one year and then doing the post in another year because it's, it's going to be hard to to uh, compare that data. Um, so we'll, we'll help you uh, in terms of, of uh, looking at your implementation timeline. Um, and um, your program participation year runs from July 1 through June 30. Just keep that in mind. We have so many different fiscal years, it's hard to keep all of these straight. So in some cases, you're going to end up um, maybe in a school or an organization that requires active parental consent before you can do any surveying. And if it's required, um, then you, and you have to obtain it for any or all of your youth participants prior to participating in the program or prior to completing the evaluation using the tools. And an active consent means it requires a parent or legal guardian to sign and return a form if they consent for their child to participate in the program and in the evaluation. Now that's not always the case, but some places may ask you for that. Um, parents may consent to allow their children to participate in the program, but not the evaluation. And um, so again, you need to assure these parents that they can, they can participate in the program. And if they don't want them to participate in the evaluation, that's, that's okay. They can still participate in the program. It's not a punitive uh, thing if they don't take the, uh, do the survey tools. And then the programs um, should use the access provided consent form. And we provide those in Appendix C in the guide. But if you need to add some additional topics to the forms, like sometimes uh, some agencies will add emergency contact information or whether or not a child has allergies. I mean, it might be part of that whole form that a parent fills out. Um, some of them ask t-shirt sizes, um, but uh, that'll be on the parental consent form. Then we have a youth assent. And so at the time that the evaluation tool is handed out to the youth, uh, the facilitator, we have a script for all of this. The facilitator reads the evaluation script and uh, that's designated for the tool that's being handed out because we have one script for the pre-evaluation script and we have a post-evaluation script and a retrospective pre-script and a post-only script. So a lot of scripts. Um, so it just depends on the tool you're using and the facilitator is going to read that. And the scripts tell the youth that, um, that they can opt out of answering certain questions on the evaluation or opt out entirely from taking it. Um, and they also provide information on how to complete the survey. Um, and um, um, one of the kind of side notes here too is that with your facilitators that are gonna be running your programs that use the evaluation tools, be sure to talk to them about how important evaluation is. And that if we don't provide the data, if we don't look at what the impact is of these programs, we're not gonna get any funding. The, you know, they're not gonna hand out uh, dollars uh, to programs just because you've been doing it for 20 years. That, you know, that doesn't work anymore. We all have to evaluate our programs. And I sat in you know, one evening, I did a site visit and sat in on a program and the facilitator said at the end, and it happened to be the last class, and the facilitator had the surveys in her hand and she looked out at the parents and she said, well, okay, we got, we have to do these now. So, you know, fill them out and give them back to me. I mean, it was like, really, you know, come on, let's, let's try a little bit harder on this. And that was when, so from that point on, every time we talk about evaluation with grantees that are starting, think about how important it is to find out 
what your programs, what the impact your programs are having. And um, all the questions that you're asking, that information is being fed back to your funding agency. And if they read that, hey, you know, you, you served 300 kids and you only did 20 surveys, you know, that's not, that's not gonna look too good. Um, or that there was no impact or was impact. I mean, that, that's gonna, you know, um, that's gonna impact on funding levels. Like, well, maybe, maybe it's not worth funding these programs anymore uh, if, if we can't get any, any data on them. So it's, it's important. And, that, and I encourage you in the guide, we talk about the research on all these various concepts that we're looking at. Read that, don't just scan it and say, oh, this is too much, but read through that and, and get that in you so that when you talk to your facilitators, you're presenting that information to them also. Um, we talked about attendance records and some uh, that's important. Uh, and we're pro we provide you with a, um, uh, a sample uh, that you can use. Uh, you have to keep attendance records um, on any, any participant attending a curricular session. And uh, with the new evaluation process, attendance sheets should include a checklist indicating if each participating youth received an active parent consent uh, and the columns are set up so if it wasn't required, you can check off it wasn't required. But if they have a consent or not, that has to show up on the uh, attendance sheet. And we put a and we put an attendance sheet in your guide. Um, and so you know you, you can use this one uh, if you decide you want to develop your own. Make sure it has all the information on it that the one in the guide has, so that you'll be during site visits at Access does. They'll look at these attendance sheets to make sure you're uh, in compliance there. Everything's been translated to Spanish. Um, all the facilitator scripts for each evaluation tool has been translated and can be given to or read to the youth who are Spanish uh, dominant and may not understand it. Um, and it can be read in English or it can be read in English. And the parental consent forms also been translated. Uh, and the translations follow the English versions of the, of the document. The other thing that we've uh, built for you in an Excel spreadsheet is a tracking log for the coalition subcommittee and ad hoc meetings. And um, I think Emma mentioned earlier, um, access requires you have at least nine formal coalition meetings a year. And uh, you have to have eight sectors represented um, and uh, that a formal coalition meeting doesn't include a work group subcommittee or an ad hoc meeting. Um, but we also want to know if you had those things. So we're, we'll be tracking uh, attendance at work groups, subcommittees, or ad hoc meetings uh, with the meeting tracking log. And the representation at each meeting should be tracked with your meeting notes and sign-in sheets and make sure on your sign-in sheet that the person indicates what sector they're with. Um, and if they don't know, that's always something to discuss with your coalition members. Um, you know, what, what sector they're representing. And then the output data uh, is entered on the meeting tracking log. Now, this is an example of process evaluation right here, okay? This is data that you're collecting for the process evaluation. So when you fill out your evaluation plan and you're talking about your coalition meetings and things, this is how you're gonna collect your data on this for your process evaluation. You're gonna count the number of meetings. You're gonna count the number of people representing a sector, count the number of sectors represented. Those are all uh, types of process uh, pieces and those are called outputs. So uh, if you've got an output, which is usually a number, um, that's part of your process. And so here are the two templates. I put them all on one, <laughs> on one screen. But the first template on the left over here, this is gonna be your coalition um, tracking template in Excel. And we start in July and go all the way across. And I've cut it off here in September, but we go in, we go across the 12 months. And so it's all set up so that you come in and you enter the date, your formal meeting date at the top here. And then all you do is go down and just put in the number of how many people, how many individuals were in attendance by sector, okay? And then once you put those in, whoops, keep rolling my thing here, um, down at the bottom, it automatically calculates it, okay? You don't have to add it up. 
it automatically calculates it and it tells, it'll also count how many sectors were represented, okay? So this will be part of what Access sees um, because this will eventually go into SharePoint and, um, and Access will see this uh, as part of your tracking log. So this is the coalition so they can see, do you do nine meetings and were the eight sectors represented? And so that's all, that's all right there. The other tracking log is on those other meetings. And so we tried to think of how many other meetings you could have and, and list it, have a drop down box here. And unfortunately, this is a screenshot, so I can't pull it down any further. But so we've got almost every kind of type of you know, committee, subcommittee, whatever. But we know there's always going to be one that isn't on the list. So at the very bottom of this list, it says other. And if you click other, then you're gonna come over to this column over here and put in the name of that other. And once we see that after a while, if there's something that's mentioned over and over again, well, then we'll add it to the drop down list. So you don't have to keep doing that. Anyway, you'll put, you select here, put the meeting date in and the number of attendance and that's it. And again, process data here, okay? Now, again, I mentioned earlier something about, you know, talking about the evaluation. And if you're going into a school or a, a, another nonprofit agency or something to do work, and they want to know about this evaluation, because that's always scary to some people. Um, and so we want to we give you talking points, and we've given you quite a few uh, in the guide uh, in terms of why we measure certain things. But um, these are just some talking points here. Uh, to let them know that only aggregate data is being reported. There's nothing to identify an individual who completes the survey. So nobody's going to see that. Uh, the evaluation tools ask participants to provide their opinions based on information they learned during their attendance in the program. And um, then you talk, there's the, we talk about that, you know, parents or legal guardians may be required to give active parental consent. And um, the youth, even though the parent might say, okay, the youth still has the option to say, no, I don't wanna answer these types of questions. And that's okay. They can opt out of participating uh, if, some, if a question makes them feel uncomfortable um, and uh, if, uh, but they can still participate in the program. I've run across very few youth that don't participate. Um, and if they don't, if they don't, if they feel uncomfortable with the question, they usually write some pretty weird stuff. So I know they were uncomfortable with that question. So it's not that that particular question isn't counted, but we get some weird comments sometimes. Um, and then the parents and legal guardians can also re can request a copy of the evaluation tools at any time. But uh, again, these are if questions come up, um, you know, at least I'm get, trying to give you a little bit of information here that you can use uh, with schools. <clears throat> Here's all the appendices uh, I've referenced throughout the presentation. Yeah, Anna has a question, she has a hand up. Um, hello, um, just a quick question. Um, if, if you are working with schools um, and you have to complete any of these evaluations, is there any, any data that is um, that would identify the school uh, because I think that would be um, that would be a concern for schools that you know you that no. they would be able to identify if this data was taken at this specific school I think no there's nothing on there <clears throat> you you're you're the, gonna have the surveys okay access is not going to have the surveys and no one outside of your organization will have copies of those surveys. So um, you, um, if, if you wanna know what school you worked in, you should put that down. But when you report your data to access, you don't have to report that, that you're just reporting the numbers. So they're not gonna know what school. They'll know, they'll know what schools you worked in, but they're not gonna necessarily know that that particular survey came from those schools. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. um, but these are the appendices here. Um, again, uh, we give you real specific directions on how to enter the survey data into the Excel spreadsheets. And again, we'll do a training on that. Um, and then all of these consent forms, the sample scripts. And again, these are in English and Spanish. And then um, 
we give you directions on how to use the meeting tracking log that I just went through. Now, here's some sample Excel spreadsheets um, that I'm just going to show you briefly here. Um, and again, these are just screenshots. This thing spreads clear across the <laughs> spreadsheet. I, I don't know what letter we eventually get to. But at the very beginning um, is you can collect some demographic information here. Um, and then all of this information here above this thick black line, all of these cells are locked, okay? And they have formulae in behind those, cell, in all of those cells. So as you enter data in here, so here's, this is a, um, a survey that was done and we're looking at youth perception of risk and harm and it's a pre-survey, okay? And the question starts out, how much do you think people risk harming themselves physically or in other, and in other ways if they smoke one or more packs of cigarettes, use electronic cigarettes, vape marijuana, use marijuana, on and on and on. And the scale is one, if they said no risk, then it's one, slight risk is two, moderate risk is three, and great risk is four. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have eight surveys that came in on the pre-survey. And this was the data off those surveys. The, the first survey was a uh, female. So you put a two because she's a female and she is white. So it was a five and uh, she's Hispanic. And so that was the demographic. And then you're gonna look at the, the survey answers. And so for the first one, in terms of smoking one or more packs of cigarettes a day, she put a three, moderate risk. And then she put a two, slight risk for vaping, uh, for vaping marijuana, she put a three and on and on and on. I mean, she, she marked those. So you, you're gonna put the numbers in there. But these numbers then that are entered under smoking one or more packs of cigarettes a day, here's the frequency for how many said no risk. And you can check the data down here, zero, okay? Frequency for number two that said it was slight risk is 25% of the respondents. And then for frequency three, the moderate risk, 75%. And for those that said great risk, zero. Okay, because nobody put a four, nobody said great risk down here. Okay, so that's the freak, this is your frequencies. Okay, these are your frequencies. Then down here is the mean, and this is the average of all these ratings right here. So for smoking one or more packs of cigarettes a day, the average mean rating across all these eight people here was 2.75. Okay, so when you look at up here, they're saying smoking is kind of all, you know, almost a moderate risk on the average. Okay, that was, that's the average, the mean rating. Okay, and so you go across, I've got people's pictures here. There, um, so you go across here and here's all the items that we're measuring on this perception of risk or harm. And you can look at it item by item and you can see that smoking cigarettes and using marijuana and uh, drinking one or two drinks of alcohol and using other illegal drugs. Those all had 2.75. So in terms of risk, this group of individuals felt they were, that's more risky than some of these other areas, okay? Now, of course, I just, I entered all this data at random, so it, it means nothing at this point, but demonstration only. So here's all the mean averages for each item. And then what we're going to report though, to, um, is this composite here. So overall youth perception of risk and harm is 2.55. So that's the average of all the responses, 2.55. Okay, so you're going to enter all your survey data here. This is going, this little thing over here on the left says count and it says eight. Um, and it'll automatically count how many surveys are in here. All right, so, and again, this goes clear across your spreadsheet here uh, in terms of the different items uh, on the survey. Then on your Excel file, when you get finished entering your data and you've done a pre and a post, then your 
you have another little tab on your Excel spreadsheet that says uh, composite. And here are your composite um, scores. And here's the first one for smoking, risk and harm. And this here's that objective. Remember I showed you the objectives earlier for the NOMS data. And here's that objective that says by June 30th, 2022, uh, there, the youth are gonna show at least a 4% increase in their perception of risk and harm of smoking cigarettes as measured by the Youth Primary Prevention Survey. Well, here's the pre-mean 2.75. And you recall back on my previous sheet here, that was the composite. So it automatically is gonna fill in this, that composite is gonna automatically fill in here. You don't have to do that. The post mean, unfortunately, was a little lower. They didn't, they didn't rate, um, rate it as high. And it was a 2.63. And the percent change, and again, this is all entered for you and this is calculated for you, minus 4.5%. So their risk and harm of smoking cigarettes went down, okay? So this might be a talking point uh, when you're talking to staff about why do you think that happened? Or was it, you know, kind of look at your data? Was it somebody, um, you know, that came in late to the program or, you know, what, what went on here? And then this last column, you're going to fill in. Did it meet that target percent? No, it didn't. Okay. And um, then you go down to all of the ones that you have on your survey. And here's all the pre and the post means and the percent changes and whether or not they meet their target percent. And then at the very bottom, again, this, this whole piece is on perception of risk and harm. At the very bottom is the overall composite. 2.55 for a pre-mean, post-mean, 3.14, and a 23% change. And yes, it, it met the, the overall target percent change. Okay, so this is another piece that you'll have that again, will be you'll be um, putting on SharePoint for access. And access will see, this is what they'll see, okay? Um, they're not seeing individual data, they're seeing aggregate data. This is across all the kids that took this program uh, and did this survey. Then for the youth optional data, this is the, just another example. Again, you'll have all your survey items that you pick for your optional items. And here's like for school climate, um, here's their pre-mean, post-mean percent change. And was the target percent met? Yes. So here's just a sample of what the Excel spreadsheet's going to have for you. It'll calculate all of this, and all you have to do is put in, did it meet the percent change? And you just look over here at your goal and see, did it? You know, And in this case, it was yes, 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 all the way through. And why do I have that there? This is the same thing I just showed you. Um, I must have copied it twice. So then what access is going, oh, I know, I know what it was. So, okay. So like I said, you're going to copy, you're going to copy this piece from your spreadsheet and you're going to take it over to SharePoint and access is going to have a composite sheet there. You're going to find your agency tab. You're going to open that tab and you're going to paste this in. Okay. Every agency is going to do that. And then access has their own tab. That's the aggregate youth noms data. So here we've got that other, that other sheet showed a count of eight. This shows a count of 200. And so it's going to have all the youth that were done during this particular time period that the, you're looking at the data. Um, it's got the pre and post means, and this is across all the programs that are using measuring 30 day use of alcohol, or they might be using or looking at 30 day use cigarettes. Okay, now here's a case where you've got um, this error. This is essentially an error message right here. And that's because there was no pre mean. So something happened that a, the, the pre-surveys were administered, something happened so that there's no data here. And when that happens, then you're gonna get this 
And this isn't included in any calculation then. So by having a, if there was a, a confusion in a survey administration or something, you, you're not gonna get, um, get messed up because it was included in the final calculations. So if you see this on the composite sheet, that just means something happened and you need to go back and look to see, did you miss giving a survey or, or what was the deal? Um, and, uh, but here, then the target percent um, is 1% uh, and uh, they can, and access can see that these all went way over the 1%, okay? And down at the bottom, and unfortunately it cut, cut off, darn it. There's a composite down here at the bottom of, 30, of the 30 day use, okay? And then finally, training and technical assistance. Um, Wellington's going to be um, conducting virtual training on the use of the evaluation spreadsheets, including how to enter the data, uh, how to compile the data to send to access via SharePoint, We'll be providing you training on the completion of uh, some other templates using Excel spreadsheets. And then after the training, we will be, the team's gonna be available to provide technical assistance as needed until the end of uh, September. Um, so, you know, if we need to sit with you and go through and work through these spreadsheets with you, we can do that, okay? And so that's the end of my presentation. Any questions before I get out of here? Oh, thank you, Jane. Just looking at the um, chat box, um, there was a question in the beginning, what if we're not serving youth? And I think you addressed it, but I just yes. want to make sure we, we address yes. it here as well. Um, and right. if there's any additional comments on addressing youth versus adults or older adults, we can have that conversation too. We have, we went through, in fact, I have a page, I, totally missed even looking at my pages of notes here. <laughs> uh, but we have we have questions and uh, it was specifically for asking um, elderly um, individuals uh, and then also just adults, you know, they don't have to be elderly adults, um, but we have uh, optional, the optional questions for if you're just working straight with adults. Perfect, thank you. And then there's, um, Courtney said, these are great, Jane, thank you. So some positive feedback You're there. Welcome. Good. And then is there any other uh, people who wanna type in questions, come off mute and ask questions, anything at all? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, just okay. want to echo, uh, Jane, your comments on the importance of evaluation. Um, and this has been something that, especially for the prevention field that with ACTS has been working with, trying to build up and do a little bit more work in. Um, SAMHSA is also very interested in us building up our evaluation system a little bit as well. And they've been partnering with us to help us with this. Um, but one thing I hope is coming through when um, we're developing these templates or we're talking about evaluation and the data and the collection is that while these are deliverables of access and um, there's something that we use to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our funders, our overall funders being SAMHSA, um, I'm really hoping you guys can see the utility of these documents and these tools that we're using for also um, building your community in other ways or trying to, to secure other types of funding outside of access. Um, of course, we want there to be sustainability. Um, we do know that these are grant funds and they're not always um, going to be around and we never know what may happen with federal budgets. Um, so we're hoping that this can also help build some sustainability in your guys' communities and you can see the utility of using the data and the information you get from these tools and these templates and these practices to potentially apply for other grants like DFCs or local funding. Um, and that also helps us too because we can also try to get more funding from the state government or we can apply for more funding at the federal level when we have this type of data available. It's, if it's readily available to us in this manner, it definitely helps us a lot too. So I hope that that's coming through. Um, and I hope no one is feeling overwhelmed or anxious about all the requirements that are coming due for you. Um, I can 100% appreciate that. 
And I do just want to say, especially with the evaluation, as Jane mentioned, Wellington, they're an amazing team and they've provided so much technical assistance to us. And I know that they will be working really hard and really well with all of you as well, as well as us to make sure that everything is being done appropriately. So this is a team effort. So I don't want anyone to be super worried about anything that's coming through. Um, we're definitely going to have as much support for everybody as possible when it comes to evaluation and then just general contract um, oversight. So, okay. Anything else, Jane, from evaluation or items to bring up with the group today? Uh -huh. I think that's it. And, and like I said, you know, we'll be providing some training in TA and we have a meeting tomorrow with access to discuss all of that and the timing, timing of it. So we will be back in touch with you. But um, yeah, and, and then once that starts, don't ever hesitate to reach out uh, to get some help from us because uh, we'll, we're eager to make it work uh, for you because it's, it's important. Gabby and Jane, can I just ask a quick question? And I know you said it, but my brain is like oatmeal right now with everything I'm trying to take it all in. What is sort of the timeline with this form of evaluation in conjunction with our other deliverables? And I, cause I know Jane, you did a really beautiful job of sort of some, uh, some of us will be doing pre and post, some retroactive post, post that type of thing. So what is the timeline for this evaluation component? When your programs start, you've got you've got some upfront work to do first, and then once you're once you're uh, on your implementation plan, when you start before you start implementing your programs, we will have worked with you anyway to provide you with the TA and get you set up, and we'll help you go through. In fact, when you get ready to work on you know your evaluation plans aren't due until January, but we can help you look at those prior to that before. Uh, even before the end of September, so that we've got, so we make sure you've got the right uh, tools to use. And then when your programs start, you will already know, oh, we're going to do a pre-post youth survey with this group, or we're just working, I forgot what group you're working with, but you know, we're just working with the elderly, and so we're going to do this adult pre-post survey or retrospective survey or, you know, however, however it gets set up. But you'll know when you start your program, which surveys you're going to use, and you'll already have somebody trained to do the data input into those spreadsheets, and it should it should roll out like clockwork. Awesome, thank you. Um, Jane, another question. Um, so some of the evidence-based programs have their own um, surveys. Uh, are, are we going to be using pre and post on top of the evidence-based surveys that the programs require, the evidence-based programs have, or are we not using the evidence-based programs um, surveys? Um, what, what happens in, in, that, in those cases? I just got kicked off. Oh, we can still see and hear you. I can. <laughs> All right, I, I think my electricity did a, you know, um, I think I caught all of your question. Um, so there are, there are pre and post surveys that come with your, with your programs. One of the things we do not wanna do is we do not wanna over survey these participants. And our surveys are ones that are required under your contract with access. So um, you, you'll do those surveys. There's no need to do your pre-post surveys um, that you get in with your packet from your program. Most of the stuff that uh, we're asking, uh, they're the national measures uh, anyway, and most of them are going to align pretty much with what some of the evidence-based programs are gonna be asking. That help? Um, just, just to clarify, so are, we're not using the, the evidence-based program survey because um, some of them are like, you know, probably like 50 questions pre and then 50 questions post. So we're not using those and we're using what access requires from us, right? Okay. Exactly. Any other questions regarding evaluation or anything else for the Wellington crew here today? All right. 
not hearing anybody, not seeing anything in chat, but if you do have questions as they come, just let us know. Um, as Jane mentioned, there'll be separate technical assistance and training sessions coming up. So <laughs> we will have more information coming your way regarding how to get everybody trained up and ready to go. All right, so with that, I'm going to go, well, I wanna just take a quick break. We have about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven slides left. Um, depending on how long our Q&A session goes, if there's any lingering Q&A, we might be able to get done early. But also, if you guys need a, a break, it's been a couple hours since we had a break, <laughs> we can totally take a quick break if we'd like to. So what does the group want to do? We do five minute bio break, come back, knock this out, or we can just keep plugging through and see how we do. I think we should keep plugging through, see how we go. Keep plugging through and seeing some nods. Yeah, we'll just go ahead and knock them out. Oh, okay, then let's let's keep going. You guys are great. <laughs> you're you're trucking along today. So okay, let me go ahead and share my screen for our last few slides we have coming up. All right, perfect. So we mentioned this in the past, but we do have some um, references. I guess in the in the past day, not the past past, but earlier today we talked about the reference slides. Um, where we do list a lot of our information regarding our 320T1 policy, which is where all of our grants live, um, our access grant website. Um, we definitely recommend taking a look um, at the website if you guys have any questions or would like any information. Um, we do have some more information on um, Arizona revised statutes or codes that we also have to adhere to. Not only are there federal codes, there are state codes. So if you ever wanna get lost in state code, you're more than welcome to take a look at those. Um, we also looked at our federal code as well. Um, these are kind of like our guiding, guiding lines for um, administering our funds. So there's sometimes interesting to kind of see what the federal language looks like if you're ever interested. Uh, we also have a frequently asked question document that's posted on the website. Um, this is actually being updated as we speak. So some of the items on there may no longer um, make a lot of sense because the system has changed a little bit since we had these FAQs updated, but we are currently updating them. So, but if you do want to take a look at them now as they stand, you're more than welcome to take a look there, but we will be uploading new FAQs, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks um, to update the current uh, structure of the system. And then of course, if you ever want to go take a look at SAMHSA's website, um, again, if you were just interested to learn more about their block grant procedure and how they administer funding to the states uh, like they do with us, that's another option for you there too. Um, and you can also kind of get a bit of a more in-depth look at uh, what we have to adhere to as a state grantee and then you guys being our grantees under SAMHSA. Okay, so just a couple upcoming items. Um, again, we talked a lot about the Innovative Prevention Program Intervention Protocol, or the IP protocol for short, um, training coming up next week. Um, as we mentioned, we'll go ahead and send that notification out to everybody who's on the call today, everyone who registered for the um, Zoom, I have your email. So if you are registered under one person um, and there's multiple people with the same name, I would say just make sure you forward it to your staff just to make sure that they get it as well. Um, but if there are any issues and you don't get something, just feel free to email us and we'll forward you the invite as well. Um, again, that's uh, going to be next Wednesday, July 14th from 1 to 2 p.m. It's going to be a Google Meet format, and that is optional. It's not required as per the contract, um, but again, it's recommended to those new to the tool or anyone who may need some refreshing before they submit the deliverable at the end of the month. And then the next item we have is our Access Statewide Prevention Systems Meeting. And this is a meeting where all of Access's prevention contractors, not just you guys being our new coalitions, but we also have our tribal regional behavioral authorities, as well as the governor's office, attend these meetings um, every two months. And we do a brief overview of activities. We go over any technical assistance needs. Um, sometimes we have guest presenters talk about data or new things coming up in the system. Um, and of course, access is there to provide state level updates of um, system activities and providing the information as needed. This is one of those mandatory meetings that we are um, requiring the coalition coordinators to attend or the proxy, um, depending on you know, what happens or um, having that business notice, two days business notice as much as possible. Um, and access will be adding all of the coalition coordinators to the existing meeting invites. 
Um, if you would like someone other than the coalition coordinator to be added as well, please let us know um, so that we can add you to the invite list. So at this point, there's nothing needed from you guys unless you would like to add someone besides the designated coalition coordinator that is in the Google Doc um, that we shared earlier this morning as well. And again, that is a mandatory meeting. If um, that's every fourth Wednesday, every two months. And so if this is just something that just doesn't work out with your schedule, and it turns out it's something that we may need to revise the dates for if a lot of people are having trouble making that work, we can have that discussion. But then also you can always utilize the proxy um, protocol to ensure that there's coverage at those meetings as well. So any questions about those meetings coming up? All right, so our next prevention systems meeting is gonna be Wednesday, July 28th from 10 to 12 noon. Got some chats coming up here. All right, perfect. I'll make sure I send some documents to people. The next meeting after July will be when so if it's a prevention systems meeting, it's every fourth Wednesday, every two months. So then our next meeting would be in September, the fourth Wednesday. When I add you guys to the um, invite, it's automatically recurring. So we'll, make, we'll be able to see the, the calendar, but I don't have the, <laughs> the calendar in front of me at this moment, so I apologize. But the fourth Wednesday in September would be when we're gonna meet. It's the same time, 10 to 12 noon. All right, and then some more upcoming meetings is that access uh, co uh, coordination staff or your grant coordinators will begin reaching out to you to schedule regular check-ins. Um, it will be something that will be recurring on the books uh, to ensure that um, we're providing technical assistance, assisting with items as needed, monitoring progress, et cetera. And we are looking to have the coalition coordinator attend those meetings and then other staff as requested in advance or as needed. So. If you have other staff or members who'd like to attend those meetings, absolutely feel free to invite them. Um, there may be some times where we invite fiscal. If some fiscal TA is needed, we'll invite fiscal to those meetings. And then your fiscal staff can also attend those meetings as well. Um, these are really just touch bases um, to make sure that we're answering questions and giving you guys as much support as possible. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of information coming at you guys. There's a lot of stuff coming due. <laughs> And um, as I said, I, I can imagine some of you are feeling anxious. I'm feeling like a good, happy anxious, but I also understand it can be some anxiety going on here. And I really want us to be able to work together. Um, and I wanna say too, that we are 100% aware this is a new process for us as well as you guys. Um, and there's gonna be some bumps. It's gonna be a little clunky every now and then, but we're gonna work through it together and everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing positive self-talk to myself here too, as I'm talking to you guys. So <laughs> if you can tell that's my style. Um, but anyway, just so you guys maybe feel a little bit more at ease about this, we're gonna be providing as much support as we can to help you guys and also help us ensure we're being successful. So, and road bumps are 100% expected and we are ready to take those on and move through them as quickly and efficiently as possible. All right. So as far as the next steps, we aren't planning at this point to have another meeting like this on the books, um, unless it's something that we need to address. This meeting was recorded, so it's our intention to allow you guys to have access to the recording after the fact. So if you need to go back and listen in on something we said earlier, or if you maybe stepped away for a break and you weren't sure what was said in the, the timing you were taking a break, then you can always come back to that section as well. They'll take us a little while to get that posted. We have to go through a process to get everything posted and then as well as um, converting the Zoom link into a um, format that we can post. But that'll be posted in the next few weeks, I can imagine, and so that'll be available to you guys. Um, and then as well, if you have staff that couldn't attend today that you'd like to give that recording to, it will be open and accessible to anybody who'd like to see it. So feel free to share, um, use it as many times as you need. But again, if there's questions that come up that weren't answered today, just feel free to reach out to your access contact person and we'll address those questions as well. And then um, questions and discussions. So I think we've done a good job answering questions as we've gone, but this is kind of our final stage uh, or our final time to ask uh, for you guys to ask any lingering questions 
Um, anything else about the contract, about fiscal, about timelines for deliverables, anything like that. So is there anything else we can offer to you guys or answer for you guys that we haven't already discussed today? And you can put it in chat or come off mute, whichever way you feel most comfortable with. <laughs> Gabby, this is Jen from NAV. I just took a quick look at September and it looks like there's five Wednesdays in the month. Um, so when that happens, it will always be the fourth, not just the last one of the month. Okay. Yep, always the fourth. Yeah. Just, okay. That's cool. our, our schedule at the moment. So always awesome. plan on the fourth Wednesday. Okay. Every two months. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions, items? Um, one more question. Are the documents that were talked about in this meeting, are they going to be shared to us through SharePoint or through email? So what we're going to do, um, we're going to sh uh, share the slides and the recording through email. And in about a week or two after we've made those little changes to the templates that Emma mentioned um, regarding you know, dates and cleaning up some language of who to contact, We'll be sending those out. Um, I believe they can go in an email form. I've sent them via email before in a zipped folder. So if you guys have any issues opening those templates, please let us know, but we will be sending those out as well. Um, and then evaluation documents will be coming soon as well um, as we're working through the um, technical assistance and training sessions with Wellington. So you guys will have access to all the documents we discussed. And then if you um, had already messaged me or requested um, a, a copy of the contract or the scope of work, um, I will follow up with you guys on how to get that. And so you guys can have that as well. Hey, Gabby, I do have a really quick um, kind of insert. Um, in terms of like training and such with like different programs that people are utilizing, is there any way that we can like share what programs other people are using so that when it comes to training and training costs, we can maybe team up on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be a great idea. So um, if it's if it's one thing we can add to our standing agenda items for the prevention systems meetings, we can have that discussion. Um, that's only every two months though. So we may need to look at doing something maybe more regularly as trainings come available. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have things you would like to have shared with all of the coordinators, I would say go ahead and email your access um, coordinator person and we can send an email out to the entire listserv uh, to share that information with other people. Or if you guys have requests to partner or to share, then you can send that to us as well and we can send that out to the entire group. I think that's a great idea. We want you guys to partner and work together as much as possible, so. Gabby, we have a question in the chat to clarify again, the contractor expenditure report um, for this month of July, asking if it will be due on the 15th? That's a great question. Um, so usually when things, the contractor expense reports are due the month, 15 days after the previous month's end for the previous month's billing. That being said, you don't have to wait until next month to request reimbursement for expenditures that were incurred between the start of your contract and the 15th. Um, Trish had mentioned that some people like to bill on an every two week basis so that payment is maybe a little bit more um, rapid than just once a month. You guys can look to get paid twice a month for your expenditures. Um, so usually we would say, you know, you can wait for the entire month of July's billing until the 15th of August. Had to figure out which, when, which month is next year. Or if you want to start billing on July 15th, you can as well for the expenditures you incurred between the start of your contract and the 15th of July. So it's it's up to you guys and your fiscal practices what you'd like to do, um, but you do not feel like you have to wait. Um, and if you want to submit your CERs before the 15th, that's okay too. You don't have to wait till the 15th to submit it. If you're done by the 10th for last month's billing, go ahead and submit it and we'll review it um, as soon as we get it. I hope that answers your question, Trinidad. If I can answer anything else, let me know. <laughs> All right, 
anything else? I have just a quick question um, regarding the September or meeting in September. Will it be the same um, time or is, or is it a different time frame? Yeah, From, it um, is. Yep. So if it's the prevention systems meeting, it's the same time, 10 to noon, every fourth Wednesday of the second month. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, not hearing anything or seeing anything. Um, so again, we have our contact information listed here. Um, I think hopefully you guys know how to contact us. This is also listed in the Google Doc. Um, if for any reason you're not sure who to contact, like I mentioned earlier, um, if you get to one of us, we'll make sure you get to the right person. So if you're having trouble remembering in the first little while who to contact, we can help you out with that. Um, don't feel like you're you don't, not sure who to contact or who to, who to talk to here. So as well as our DGA finance um, invoice email here. So you can take a look at that if you need to for any fiscal needs and send them any information that you are requesting. All right, and with that, I just wanna say a gigantic humongous thank you to all of you. Um, I know this is a long day. This has been a lot of information and I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedules and meeting with us. And thank you to the team here. Thank you to finance, thank you to Wellington. Uh, thank you to everybody. This has been um, a project about two years in the making, so it's very exciting to see it finally starting um, and seeing everything move forward. And I hope, again, I sound like a broken record, but if you guys need any assistance at all, so don't feel like you're out on your own, that you're not sure what to do or who to talk to, we will figure it out together and we will move through. Um, and honestly, we can't do this work without you guys. You guys are the drivers and the movers and shakers, and we so appreciate everything you do in your communities. And I hope that comes across as well. So with that, we can end uh, quite a bit earlier <laughs> and you guys can enjoy some more of your time. Thank you guys so much. And we will be in touch very soon. Have a good rest of your day. Okay. Ooh.